a chance to put the two together. Uh, and now, having waited over 60 years, uh, I, I, I have a chance. Uh, and so today, I want to, this particular day, I want to talk more about, as a general discussion, about the beginnings. Um, and what I didn't realize until I started uh, researching this is uh, how much the history of science has an impact on both physics and philosophy. Um, what I did realize was the magnitude of talking about a thousand years of the history of physics. Um, this is a lifetime's worth of work or uh, the subject of a graduate degree in, in the history of science or a year's worth of, of survey course. To try to do it in a week is probably the very definition of chutzpah, but I will try. Um, but I haven't managed to do it all in five days, and so uh, I have asked for, and will have, if any of you can, um, have a Saturday lecture as well, same time, same place. I know I discussed some of the history of physics five or six years ago, but I've learned a heck of a lot since then, uh, and I want to include some philosophical ideas of which I have never done before. When I chose to study physics so many years ago, uh, it was basically for two reasons. The major reason was that physics was the hardest subject I knew that I could actually do. Uh, and, and that made it a challenge and interesting. Um, and philosophy seemed to me too hard, and I wasn't sure I could do it. Also, of course, uh, there are a lot more jobs in physics than there are in philosophy. That didn't hurt either. Um, but some of the philosophical ideas that I want to discuss this, this week um, are, are, not particularly, uh, are not particularly easy. In fact, some of them are damned difficult. Um, that they were being discussed eight to 900 years ago um, gives me some hope for the uh, intensity and, and pleasures of the human intellect and even perhaps some hope that we can survive much of the current mess we're in today. Uh, and so, as I said today, as kind of a general introduction, the history of science is the history of systems of thought about the natural world. Though the most obvious characteristic of science in modern civilization is the control it's given us over the physical world, uh, even while such control was being acquired, people uh, we're trying to bring nature within the grasp of their understanding. What questions were being asked at any particular time and what answers were people able to give? Why did such answers eventually come to sat uh, uh, did, uh, cease to satisfy our curiosity? Systems of thought, which appear very strange to us today, become more intelligible when we understand the questions they were designed to answer. The questions make sense of the answers. One system gives, gives way to another, not because fresh facts are necessarily discovered, which make the old systems obsolete, but because people, for some reason, begin to look at familiar evidence in a brand new way. From the Greeks on, the questions were usually uh, asked, were usually uh, designed to answer why things happened as they did. What science has done, and what I hope to discuss this week, is the change to leaving the why to philosophy, or maybe religion if you like, uh, and asking how things happen, which is what science does. In ancient Greece, uh, there was an attempt to discover, to, to discover what historians call the intelligible essence underlying the world of change. And those people, uh, uh, well, what, this is particularly true, uh, as, we're, uh, as we will see, when Aristotle's works became um, available to, to the Christian West. Um, and there was an attempt to reconcile his philosophy of, of a pagan Greek with theology and ecclesiastical doctrine. The image of Aristotle as a source of religious truth withered completely by the 17th century, but his influence has lasted longer than the scientific revolution from the time of Newton on. So he, he was a very important uh, person. The 
coincidence of the loss of Aristotle's authority for theology and for science were obviously related. Um, he, he moved from, from um, an eight... the microphone doing that. Maybe it's this thing interfering. Let me try taking that off. Technology is not always perfect. We'll try, try that now. Um, he turned from an ancient sage into an impious pagan uh, who espoused dubious doctrines and that was a general um, rejection of Aristotelianism that accompanied the scientific revolution. There has been a tendency to call the growth of science a rebellion against religion, and this is surely not true, as many of the greatest scientific figures of the 17th and 18th century were also religious, some deeply so. Sure, Galileo clashed with the church. Poor Giordano Bruno was unfortunately burnt at the stake. Uh, and there were some rejection by the University of Paris uh, of, of some of Descartes' uh, doctrines. Yet Descartes <clears throat> wrote a logical proof of the existence of God. Robert Boyle attacked atheism. Pierre Gassendi, uh, a very, another great Frenchman, adopted, adapt, adopted, sorry, adapted Epicureanism uh, to Catholic theology. Newton was a dedicated Christian and dedicated to what's called Arian Christianity. This is a very strange and heretical version of Christianity in which uh, Jesus is the son of God. He's not equivalent to God. It's an anti-Trinitarian view. And it was declared heretical way back in the fourth century. Yet Einstein, um, sorry, Einstein, Newton was a great believer in that nonetheless. Um, atheism had two meanings back in the, in the 17th century. It was either you were in the wrong religion, in which case you were an atheist, or of course, as today, you rejected the existence of God. Um, Aristotle fit both of those categories by that time because he had been ad adopted both by Protestants and by Catholic uh, th theology. Um, but also because his philosophy had no recourse to supernatural phenomena uh, and, and uh, the Christian doctrine um, was uh, required. Uh, many churches demanded that. By the 17th century, theologians attacked Descartes' theory of matter and Galileo's uh, concept of atoms because they undermined the concept of the Eucharist as defined but way back by St. Thomas Aquinas. To doing that again. Hmm. Any idea why that should be true? I could turn my phone. Try that, okay. Ah, oh, the, the wonders of modern technology, boy. Um, for many centuries, uh, natural science, as it was not yet called, uh, was pursued more for understanding facts than actual for use. If we start back, go back, way back to the, the Dark Ages, there was an effort made to pre preserve the few facts that remained uh, from, from uh, classical times, rather than any attempt to make original um, interpretations. But there was nonetheless technical innovations done at that time. For example, horseshoes were around because horses had been around, and they were um, used from Etruscan and Roman times, and of course, especially in Central Asia. But they were very rudimentary horseshoes and, and not useful in the hard ground of Northern Europe. And so new horseshoes were developed and were, were useful in Europe, and particularly for the long trek to the Crusades to the Middle East. And um, there were also great 
agricultural changes in, in plows and, uh, and, and various other tools. From the seventh century, uh, the conquest of much of eastern er of eastern areas by the n the newly formed religion of of Islam cut the West off from older philosophical ideas. The Middle East was what rem was where what remained of Greek thought uh, still existed. But in the West, the impact of the Goths, the Vandals, the Franks, and then in the ninth century, the Norsemen, um, they virtually destroyed learning and uh, information in the West. What did remain was confined to monasteries such as Monte Cassino uh, in Italy, which was founded by St. Benedict way back in 529. Uh, there were lots of important monasteries in Ireland, and the Irish were amongst the earliest missionaries uh, to much of Northern Europe because they were considered the toughest people who could endure the con those conditions. Um, one of the major works available um, still in, in Europe was uh, by Pliny the Elder, uh, who lived in the first century of the Common Era and who wrote a remarkable natural history. He died from poisonous gases inhaled during the uh, eruption of Vesuvius in 79 CE. But his natural history was the, large, the single largest source of information for early monasteries, and it became a model for later encyclopedias and scholarly works. Um, <clears throat> it um, covered, as we shall see, an enormous amount of subject matter, um, but uh, it ref referenced lots of earlier authors, and in particular what was valuable is it had an index and if anyone who's ever tried to read a technical work in a book without an index will know how important that is. Um, his purpose, although it's called natural history, was an attempt to cover all of ancient knowledge. It's 37 books in 10 volumes, um, and it covers astronomy, mathematics, geography, ethnography, anthropology, human physiology, zoology, botany, agriculture, horticulture, pharmacology, mining, mineralogy, sculpture, painting, and even precious stones, quite a number of topics. But then it's, you know, 10, ten big books. Um, one of the major things that happened before the rediscovery of Aristotle was that some of Plato's works uh, had ex continued to exist. And there was the incorporation of what is called Neoplatonism uh, into Western thought. This is primarily a non-Christian philosophical movement based on, as I said, on works by Plato that had uh, survived. And they were it started in the third century by Plotinus and lasted through the reestablishment of a Platonic academy in Athens, which was then closed uh, by Emperor Justinian in 529. But it had considerable influence, particularly on St. Augustine, who lived back in the fourth and fifth centuries. Neoplatonism <clears throat> is concerned with the subject of ontology, uh, that is the fundamental essence of things and can probably be easily described as mind over matter. Um, Neoplatonism is a modern historiographical uh, term, uh, and, and the people of the time did not use it. Other important names of that time, for th and in those who might be interested, are Porphyry, Iamblichus, and my very favorite, Simplicius. Um, I like people with names like that. Uh, in the Middle Ages, Neoplatonic uh, ideas were studied and discussed by Islamic, by Christian, and by Jewish thinkers. Um, there were, it had a strong influence uh, on the Italian Rene Renaissance and people like Marsilio Ficini, Pico della Mirandola. It continued uh, through the 19th century in universalism and exists even today in modern day spiritualism. Aristotle had been a student of Plato just as Plato had been a student of Socrates. He was much more of a realist and not, not as much an idealist. And uh, his writings are largely incorrect, 
but it did include some highly important direct observations. Plato was concerned with the true and eternal uh, ideal reality, but Aristotle called such reality essence. Um, and it was more concerned with its opposite, which he referred to as matter. Matter is stuff. It's without shape or form or purpose. It's just stuff, pure potential, not real. Essence is what provides the shape or form or purpose to matter. Essence is perfect, complete, and has no substance and no uh, solidity. Essence and matter, therefore, need each other. And I'll come back to these ideas uh, several times during this week. With Neoplatonists, natural curiosity about the workings of the world gave way to uh, desire for uh, an undisturbed peace of mind, uh, which could be won by a mind lifted above the dependence on matter and the flesh. They asked the question, what is worth knowing and doing? Whereas Christian thinkers adopted these ideas and they answered that what's worth knowing and doing are things which lead to the love of God. In Neoplatonic thinking, eternal ideas as opposed to matter and essence are called forms. And they exist apart from uh, external essences. Uh, the material world, the world we experience is con um, through our eyes and ears, this world continually changes. Nothing we perceive is permanent. Buildings crumble, weather changes, we're born and die. Um, nothing we, s we sense is permanent. Because the material world is so changeable, Plato considered it to be unreliable. He believed that this is not the whole story and behind this changeable world, uh, lies a serious reality. It's permanent and unchangeable, and he created the idea, this idea I mentioned, of forms. An important class of forms is mathematics. Arithmetic is just an example of a universal idea. Um, but forms are not limited to mathematics because there's the idea of a tree, idea of a person, idea of a mountain ideas of objects which are not changeable the way the objects themselves are. Um, Plato says the true knowledge lies with those people who can grasp the reality behind the changeable world. To be able to grasp this reality requires a serious and difficult period of education. In the Republic, Plato gives an example of what he means. He uses the analogy of a cave. Um, One of the things that I found so difficult about philosophy was the French. People like uh, Derrida, um, uh, Foucault, Deleuze. And somebody finally said, the reason you have trouble with that is they don't give any examples of what they mean. They just use words. Uh, so I tried to, whenever possible to give examples of things uh, because it, it's less difficult. So in an example of what he means is the analogy of a cave. People who spend their whole lives in a cave um, see only shadows in the wall which are reflected from the campfire in the cave. Real physical objects are like these shadows. They change and are, un and are unreliable. But then Plato becomes political, and he says that only those who can step out into the sunlight and see the reality of forms should be the rulers. These are the philosopher kings he finds fit to rule. He's not much of a believer in democracy, of course. There are, not surprisingly, problems with the philosophical idea of forms. One of the most devastating was provided by Plato himself. It's called the third man analogy or TMA in philosophical jargon. And so I'll just mention it in case anybody is interested in such an arcane topic. Uh, if a, a man is a man because he, put, he has the form of a man, then a third form is needed to understand the man and the form of the man and so on and infinitum. Um, that's not a trivial argument. Uh, Augustine combined Christianity with Greek rationalism, and he added the idea of nature as sacramental um, 
uh, and and uh, symbolic of of uh, what he calls spiritual truths. Augustine and some of his predecessors, such as Cle uh, Clement and his student Origen, they invited investigations into the rational nature of of, uh, uh, of faith, writing that all knowledge was good. But the church, however, considered real natural knowledge as secondary stuff. Um, and what they were uh, interested in, they just wanted illustrations of the truth of morality and religion, to, um, and, and that's the, the, the great interest. For examples, the moon, um, the light of the moon was reflected, uh, was, um, in the, sorry, the moon was the image of the church reflecting the divine light. So at least they knew that moonlight was reflected light, and it's not shining by itself. The number 11, for example, which transgressed 10, the, the number of commandments, was a symbol for sin. Um, another, um, well, I'll skip that. There was a preoccupation with magical and astro astrological properties of, of uh, natural objects. And this was one of the characteristics of, of, uh, Christian, of Western Christendom before the 13th century. Astrology is problematic because it seemed to be a denial of free will. And Augustine struggled greatly against astrology, which, uh, as anybody who reads the newspapers know, is still in existence. He, so he certainly could not kill it. St. Isidore of Seville uh, tried to distinguish between the magical part of astrology and a more astronomical study of the motions of heavenly bodies. Pope John Paul II, back in the 90s, uh, nominated Isidore to be the patron saint of the internet. So um, there is a patron saint of the internet, so far as I know. Um, but even St. Isidore, who argued against astrology, admitted that the moon had an influence on plant and animal life. Uh, and that's not hard to see, because those of us who live by the sea see the influence of the moon twice a day on the ocean. And so uh, the idea that it would also have influence on human beings was not impossible. These such views went back to Plato's Timaeus, and the classical medieval exp uh, expression was given by uh, Hildegard of Bingen in the 12th century, where the hu bodily humors were associated with the movements of, he of heavenly bodies. The humors were blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, and they were associated with the uh, elements of earth, air, fire, and water. The writings of Boethius in the sixth century were of tremendous importance to monastic education. Boethius uh, was a very important figure in sixth century Rome uh, under the Ostrogothic emperors, and uh, they had won power over Western Rome by that time. But he fell out of favor uh, and was imprisoned and eventually executed by Emperor Theodoric. But while he was in prison, he wrote one of the most famous books of all time called The Consolations of Philosophy, in which he did for mathematics and logic what Pliny had done for natural science. Uh, he even included a few um, uh, fragments of Euclid and Aristotle, which had still managed to ex uh, exist. The only known examples of such works uh, until uh, Arabic translations five or six centuries later. Some scholars think um, that uh, his, his uh, work was largely responsible for the later development uh, of, uh, um, of the university system um, with, with its independent study of liberal arts, which formed the institutional basis of science and scholarly uh, revolutions in the 16th and 17th century. But from the 7th century on, Latin West used these sources. St. Isidore taught that the earth was shaped like a wheel with boundaries encircled by oceans and surrounded by concentric spheres of planets and stars. 
Beyond these lay the realm of God. The earth was only a few centuries old and was soon to perish. The only other thinker of note in the, back in the seventh century was the venerable Bede, who knew some Greek, but derived most of his knowledge from both Isidore and Pliny. Um, he had some followers, but mostly what he did was refer to these previous writers. Monastery education, which lasted for centuries and continued uh, in, in universities, and which will come upon often, was composed of the trivium, uh, three things, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And the important texts were Pliny, Pliny Boethius, and Isidore. Um, these peoples, still deeply influenced by Plato and the Neoplatonists, were serious thinkers. They had access to Plato's Timaeus, his book on nature and science, what, what he called science. Um, and this was full of ideas, mostly crazy ones, but they were thinking about causes and about changes. Um, Plato had created the idea of a demiurge. This is a fashioner of the real phys uh, perceptible physical world. Augustine replaced this idea by the Christian God. From Plato, the four basic elements of earth, air, fire, and water were composed of small indivisible particles, um, invisible particles, which are certainly have no relation to what we call of them atoms. Uh, the main masses were arranged in concentric spheres with the earth in the center, water next to it, then air, and finally fire, so as to form um, a finite spherical universe in limitless space. The sphere, um, the sphere of fire extended from the moon to the fixed stars and contained within it the spheres of those heavenly bodies and all the intermediate planets. Fire was the chief constituent of heavenly bodies. Such views re-arose later among people in France, uh, such as Thierry of Chartres, a contemporary of Peter Abelard. In this view, fire vaporized some of the waters on the earth and raised them to form the firmament above, which divided the waters below and those above the firmament. In Genesis, there is talk about water on earth and water ab above the firmament, and so they needed to, uh, early Christians needed that. The reduction of water on earth led to the appearance of dry land. The warmth of the air and the moisture of the earth gave rise to plants and trees. Stars were formed as conglomer uh, conglomerations in the supercelestial waters, and the heat developed by their subsequent motion hatched fishes and airs out of the terrestrial waters and animals out of the earth. Uh, and these animals included humans, of course, made in the image of God. And after the sixth day, nothing more was ever created. Gravity was explained by the Greeks as uh, the idea that bodies tended to come together. Stones f fell because they were primarily composed of earth, and so they fell to the earth. And, and uh, gases went up because they were related to fire, and fire is up there. So that was their idea. So that um, for, uh, one of their ideas, for example, is if you drill a hole through the entire of the earth and you drop a stone through it, it will stop at the middle. And in fact, that's not what happens. What will happen if you drop a stone is it will go from this here to a place directly opposite on the surface of the Earth and oscillate back and forth between those two places forever, except if there's air resistance, which gives you a little friction, and so it will lose some of its, uh, of its energy to heat and friction and eventually will stop at the center of the Earth probably taking several centuries to do so. Um, so these people were thinking, but they were thinking incorrectly. Because circles are the most beautiful, perfect shapes because they are symmetric, the stars, fixed stars, rotated in circles around the Earth, which was the center of the universe. The seven planets, the Moon, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, uh, 
revolved with differing velocities represented by their observed motions. Each sphere had its own intelligence or soul, which was the source of its motion. These are wild ideas, of course, all gathered from Plato's Timaeus. And he also said that space was completely full. There's no void anywhere. So movement could only occur by pushing something out of the way. So I could only move sideways by pushing the air uh, away uh, from, from me. Vision took place by a visual ray emitted from the eye to the, the object in question, and colors were due to different size fire particles that streamed off objects where they interacted with the rays coming from our eye. Um, now, this is obviously crazy, but we still have this because people often believe that I can tell someone is looking at me, okay, which is all rubbish. I mean, it's just that we happen to go back and look. And also, the idea that powerful people can, by vision, uh, affect weaker people, which is also uh, rubbish. Um, now, all religions, of course, uh, are, are riven by controversy, controversies throughout their history. Christianity, of course, is no exception uh, with controversies even, even today. For now, I want to concentrate on the period before the year 1000. The period of most interest to us lies in the 5th century right now and is centered, centered uh, on uh, Nestor, uh, who was the patriarch uh, of, of um, Constantinople for three years from 428 to 431. Uh, these were times when there was a lot of controversy in the church uh, and there was a great discussions about whether Mary was, uh, the, 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 uh, was a saint as the mother of God or not. Um, Nestor um, wrote that Christ was in reality two persons a human person and a divine person. This is different, of course, from Arianism, in which uh, Jesus was not divine, uh, was the son of God rather than being. Okay, this too was very uh, heretical. Is it, my, is it working? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and. Um, this was uh, eventually declared heretical at the Council of Ephesus uh, in 431, and then later in the Council of Chalcedon in 453. Um, so Jesus is fully div divine and fully human. Oh, I, I think it's not where it's okay. Probably the batteries are dying. It's okay. Um, some of Nestor's thoughts uh, were influenced by Aristotle, as he had a, uh, they had a little of Aristotle's writings. But the more such thinking developed, the stronger was the Catholic rejection of it, and the more punishment these heretics experienced. And of course, the punishment for heresy was rather severe. And so the, the Nestor and his followers were driven out of Constantinople, settled in the far east of Turkey, and then eventually in southwestern Persia. Um, his, this ideology died out sometime around the fourth, 14th century, so it lasted close to 1,000 years. Um, and it was hugely influential in that time. But the major point of interest from our point of view is that they had copies of Aristotle's works. And they had translated them from Greek into Syriac, which was their own language, and they took them with them. They were, uh, they were missionaries and converted Christians as far away as India and um, even China. Uh, they. Uh, were, were settled in a town called Jundishapur in the southwest of, of Iran, uh, 
uh, and it was one of the first scientific and intellect medical centers of Islam, and still has a very famous and well-known medical school. Now, this part of the Persian Empire was then conquered by uh, Arab caliphs, and they became deeply interested in Aristotle, and they found Nestorian Christians and, um, and Jewish translators to go from Syriac into Arabic. These works then followed Arab conquest west, all the way west across North Africa to Morocco and into Spain. And it's from such works that Aristotle eventually became available to Christian Europe. So we owe the Nestorians a great deal, I think. By the 10th century, nearly all the texts of Greek science that were ever to become known uh, in the Western world were, event were available in Arabic. Um, there was slow contact that then between the Arabs and Christians that brought this uh, Aristotle's works into Europe. By the 11th century, uh, there were translations being made of Galen and Hippocrates from Arabic into Latin by Benedictine monks at the famous Monte Cassino uh, monastery. Monte Cassino, as many of us will know, was horribly and apparently unnecessarily destroyed in World War II. Many great scholars, including Thomas Aquinas, studied there. It's listed as the worst aesthetic disaster of the war and seems to have been bombed in, in uh, error. But of course, the bombed ruins served as great defensive positions for Nazi troops, and conquering it was a difficult task. Sicily passed from Byzantine to Arab and then to Norman invaders in 1090. Conditions became more favorable for harmony and translations there than were even done in Spain. By the 13th century, translations were increasingly made directly from Greek to Latin and without the Arabic intermediary. And by the 14th century, especially when the Middle East was overrun by Mongol invaders, translations from that region ceased entirely. For more than three centuries, from the middle of the 8th to the end of the 11th, Arabic peoples had um, had uh, intellectual superiority um, um, throughout, uh, from Baghdad all the way to Spain. In the 12th and 13th centuries, Europeans began seriously to rediscover these Greek and Arabic sources, particularly, as I said, Aristotle and Euclid. So this thus began a, a, a marriage uh, of the rationalism of philosophy and mathematics with empirical science to uncover the structure of nature. Aristotle's works seem to provide a complete system of scientific thought, and medieval science consisted of working out the consequences of this new approach to nature. Because of these new works, people started to ask how the facts recorded in Genesis could be explained in terms of natural causes. In the remarkable 12th century, and what has come to be called the Renaissance of the 12th century, I come to, to a man known as Adelard of Bath. This is not Peter Abelard, but Adelard of Bath, an Englishman, a hugely important translator from Arabic to Latin. The first serious record we have of scientific thought is a conversation between Adelard and his nephew. He was widely traveled, um, and unlike most people who know, knew Arabic, they had Westerners who knew Arabic, had learned it in Toledo in Spain, uh, Adelard had studied in southern Italy, in Sicily, and in the Middle East. He, he had traveled and it was increasingly familiar with the works of Arab authors who had read and commented, commented on Aristotle. Um, and he wrote a book called Natural Questions, or in Latin, Questionis Naturalis. Uh, his less traveled nephew had the traditional uh, views of the few remin remnants of Greek science. Uh, the, and for his part, Adelard had read the Arabic text of Euclid's Elements and some of the astronomical works 
of the Persian al-Khwarizmi. Al-Khwarizmi, Musa al-Khwarizmi, uh, was known in Latin as algorithmi. And um, in, in the word algorithm that we use today for computers was in the 18th century called an algorithm in mathematics in honor of this man uh, who did so much work. Uh, in those days. The topics Adelard read covered meteorology, the transmission of light and sound, the growth of plants, and the cause of tears. The knowledge of his nephew, who was uh, educated in a monastery in France, was based on the existing works of Boethius. Adelard was particularly important in following thinking he had adopted And this is a comment of his. Um, he considered um, preserving, preserved the discussions with his nephew. Why do plants spring from the earth? What is the cause? And how can it be explained? Of course, all of this was due to the creator God. But uh, the process was not without a natural reason as well. So this is what. Uh, he, he wrote to his, uh, to his nephew. Uh, so now I want to wander back and forth for a little bit uh, between the 12th and 13th centuries. Um, such a comment as, as uh, Adelard marks the time when the medieval conception of nature began crossing the watershed. This divides the period when nature was looked at to provide illustrations for moralizing to that in which nature is studied for its own sake. Thinkers such as Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, who we will talk about later, gradually realized that this new science did not conflict with divine providence, though it changed the attitude towards the relation between reason and faith. Eventually, contradictions with observed facts led to radical criticism of Aristotelian science while the extension of experiment and mathematics produced new knowledge. Then by the beginning of the 17th century, when we come to Galileo and others, experiment and mathematics produced such striking results that we call this time the scientific revolution. These methods reach back to the 13th century and were temporarily stifled during the Renaissance. But then they came into maturity and, and effectiveness with Galileo. And the scientific revolution grew so rapidly that by 1800, Kant said, a new light flashed on the students of nature. I think that this change makes the study uh, of these people and their thoughts of special interest to us today. The Crusades were of enormous importance during much of this time. At the beginning of the 13th century, there was already the Fourth Crusade, um, which was, had been created and was on the march from Europe to the Middle East. Um, now, it had made a, an agreement with the uh, prince uh, with a Byzantine prince to intervene in Constantinople uh, and to restore the prince's father as emperor. Now, this is a very significant thing because uh, to, they were originally going to Egypt and they would set up in Egypt and then, of course, march north to attack the Holy Land. Um, but they had to get there, and they had got there by ship and the ships were built, of course, by the Venetians. And they had no money to pay the Venetians. And so they made a deal, because the Venetians wanted to control the eastern shore of the Adriatic. And this was um, dominated by the city of Zara, which is now Zadar in Croatia. And so they, the deal was they would attack and conquer Zadar. And this was the first time that Christians had attacked a Christian and destroyed a Christian city. They then went on to Constantinople. And instead of just restoring the, uh, the, the, the prince um, or the f father of this prince, they sacked and destroyed the city 
Uh, and that's often thought by historians as uh, being leading to the destruction of, of um, the Byzantine emperor, empire uh, about 200 years uh, later than this. It certainly weakened it a great deal. But the capture of Byzantium by the Christians meant that an enormous number of works that were in, uh, in Constantinople, in Byzantium, became available in Western Europe. And many Greek scholars moved to Italy and France, so much so uh, that the University of Paris urged its scholars to go to Greece and learn the, the language and study its literature. Um, by the middle of the 12th century, then mo many of Aristotle's works on logic were translated, as was Euclid's geometry and his optics, and as well as an interesting book called, uh, by Hero of Alexandria called Pneumatica, and so people were able to build much better pumps. Uh, there were works defining the center of gravity, the lever, the balance. All of these led to new inventions. By the end of the 12th century, the medical works of Galen and Hippocrates had been translated. Uh, and early in the 13th century, his metaphysics was translated. Um, this caused such an increase in educational interest, shifting toward philosophy and science, that even then, old scholars were bemoaning the shift away from literature and history to more scientific uh, studies, something which has never ceased for the last 800 years. Uh, perhaps the most useful and important translated works were those of the ideas of Ptolemaic astronomy and the trigonometry associated with it. Translations had come from Arab sources, of course, many as early as the 10th century. These Arab thinkers, as I've said, did not add much knowledge to the old Greeks, but they did create better observing instruments. And based on improved data, uh, tables were ordered by King Alfonso the Wise after the Christian reconquest of Spain. Alfonso died in 1284. The calculations were eventually published and called the Alfonsine uh, Tables. The city of Toledo, where much of this work was done, was in fact the zero of longitudinal merid, uh, measurement uh, until about the 16th century when it was replaced by uh, Greenwich. The second most significant sets of works were those on medicine, and there were real contributions from Arab science, the diagnosis, for example, of smallpox and measles. Another area in which um, Arab science made significant progress was in optics, and they made advances uh, discussing spherical and parabolic mirrors, the pinhole camera, lenses, and vision. So great were these contributions uh, and the number of the, from these newly rediscovered sources that um, even their names appeared in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and the Wife of Bath's prologue. And you can see uh, Hippocrates, Galen, um, Averroes, who is a, an Arab much more common, uh, and lots of, uh, lots of uh, people with 14, uh, 15th century spellings. Another area of huge importance, of course, was mathematics. And here, the Arab contribution was really that of passing along uh, information from the Hindus in India. Uh, there was considerable trade between Arab lands and, and India. And so what we call Arabic numerals are really Hindu numerals. In their system, the value of a digit um, was shown by its position so that a one by itself was very different from a one followed by uh, other digits. And some of these digits even included zero, which they certainly understood and used. They could take square and cube roots. And they understood fractions. They could calculate interest. They could sum arithmetic and geometric series. They could solve first and second order equations. Um, they could 
and all of the operations of simple arithmetic and algebra, and they had created much of trigonometry along with tables of the values of the sine function. Their system of arithmetic, which the Arabs adopted and brought, uh, was brought to Europe about 1202 by Fibonacci, and um, Fibonacci is well known to mathematicians. The incredible usefulness of this system can be appreciated if you ever try to multiply two numbers using only Arabic numerals. Okay, that's 46 times 112, and the answer is 5,152. Try doing that without a calculator or without Hindu numerals. I couldn't, I don't know anybody who can. Anyway. Um, there was a delay in the acceptance of these uh, because um, arithmetic was not a great problem for business because they used the abacus to do all their, their calculations. And so the new system of numbers didn't destroy Roman numerals for quite some time. Businessmen didn't start using them until the end of the 13th century, a hundred years after the introduction in Europe. Common use took some three centuries. Decimal weights and measures had to wait, of course, for the French Revolution. The vicissitude of new ideas is, is seen in the, new, in the slow adoption of these uh, numbers, and this is not atypical of many such new ideas. The Christians of the 12th century uh, asked questions of nature to illustrate the moral purposes of God and what could provide a natural explanation for the facts described in the Bible. Arab thinkers did not ask such questions. What they searched for instead were things like the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, the talisman, the word of power, and the magical properties of plants and animals. Their questions and their answers lay in the study of alchemy, of magic, and astrology. And it was partly from a desire to share this knowledge that led Christians uh, to, to uh, Arab centers of Arab culture in Spain and Sicily. Many thought that the ancient Greeks had this knowledge and had hidden it in cryptic writings. People still have such beliefs. For the Arabs of those times and for Western thinkers from the 12th century on, there was basically no distinction between what we would call natural science, magic, and the occult. Mad natural and magical causes were considered equally responsible for physical phenomena. The appeal to such things has remained alive, of course, to this day. That planets could exert influences by means of rays whose ultimate cost was celestial harmony. And the effect of these rays varied with the configuration of the planets. Um, somehow, the idea that a planet, which is, for example, Jupiter, is 590 million kilometers away, and Saturn is on an average of 1.2 billion kilometers away, how that could possibly affect people's lives on Earth. Uh, is something that escapes me. In those days, of course, people didn't know how far away the planets were, but today that knowledge is quite common. Alchemy was, of course, most famously involved with the transmutation of metals, but for the more serious thinkers, such as Isaac Newton, it was, um, how did that happen? Good heaven, okay, there's where I want to be. Um, such as Isaac Newton, what people were interested in uh, was uh, the, uh, the, the um, prolongation of human life and even an attempt to discover names of traitors and adulterers. Um, these were quite common even up through the 16th century, and as I said, even geniuses such as uh, Newton b worked in this field. In fact, Newton did war work on um, um, on alchemy than he did on physics. In Bacon's view, and this is Roger Bacon, not the centuries later Francis Bacon, the church would overcome both the Antichrist and the Tartars, as the Middle Eastern Tatars were, were known, um, 
incorrectly called because the Christians changed the name of Tatar to Tartar to be consistent with uh, the, the um, uh, Greek idea of hell, Tartarus. Science was to lead the mind to contemplation of the creator, a manner of thinking in which all truth was one and the truth uh, that was revealed